for our stuff is to see what the gospel of Jesus has done globally. And uh, I'm grateful for those little tastes. Maybe a little later today or next week, you'll get an Irish blessing. Uh, it's one of many of the blessings that have been circulated around among the people of God. Uh, and uh, you may ask, so in a nutshell, Pastor, what in the world is going on? <laughs> and I want to tell you, in a nutshell, David already had that covered. Uh, he said, come sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And since the ascension of Jesus, sitting at the right hand of the Father, all this period of time of waiting is the enemies of God in the gospel, often being won over as Saul was by the grace of the gospel, but kneeling there until he makes his enemies a footstool for his feet. And so through the ages and through the events of history and through the diseases and through all that happens, it is God, the wise God, preparing a, a place, renewing this place, affecting the work of the gospel in the lives of people until he comes again and we see him and our joy will be complete. And I'm hopeful that you affirm that even from the beginning of the service. I believe I believe in the resurrection. I believe that he's coming. I believe in a new heaven and a new earth. But understand that the focal point about that is not you and your belief. The focal point of that is him and what he's accomplished. And so we put our faith in him. I had wonderful conversations with some of our people in recent weeks and coming back to the reality that our, our faith is not in our ability to believe. Then the focus, oh, how can I have a stronger faith? I'm not sure my faith is strong enough. Our, our faith is in Him. And our weakness exposes our need to trust Him. And so our faith is not in our ability to believe, it's in His power to save. And I hope that in these COVID days you uh, see that afresh. Well, on the screen I hope you have a verse. Uh, yeah, there it is. Assurance of answered prayer, John 16, 24. Are any of you familiar with this verse? This would be a very good time to put your hand up. <laughs> if you've been around for a while, we emphasize there's five basic lessons, lessons on assurance. If you ought to have down, you ought to have verses memorized. I know it's tough. What's your phone number again? I know it's tough to memorize. <laughs> uh, well, what's your street address again? Uh, if we go over stuff long enough, we'll get, eventually get it down. And so I want you to just review with me this wonderful promise that we looked at a few weeks ago as we looked at the Upper Room Discourse. We're coming back there again today. But um, let's see, reference before and afterwards. So topic, reference, verse, reference. That's our order here. Okay, topic is assurance of answered prayer. The reference is John 16, 24. Until now you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete John, very good. And you could probably write that in a little card and go over it day by day and get it down. And I want to tell you, it's just a, a precious promise of Scripture that unlocks the realities of God's grace at work in our life. That somehow God is interested in us and, and what's on our heart. And it doesn't necessarily mean that God gives us exactly what we pray for because often He has something even better in mind. And who wants to settle for second best? And so when we pray, he hears and he answers, and I want till this morning to look at the context in which this promise, this amazing promise is given. So we're going to spend some time there today. And uh, I hope that uh, we learn a little bit more as we process this whole idea about the joy that we have as believers because we're under the blessing of God, because of the grace of God, and how that overshadows anything that comes to our lives day by day. We want to talk about like the extreme case of suffering and how the joy God gives and suffering can somehow not only coincide, but even work together. So I want you to identify with me the mystery author behind these words. What wings are to a bird and sails to a ship, so is prayer to the soul. Any concern too small to be turned into a prayer is too small to be made into a burden. <laughs> there is no pit so deep that God's love is not deeper still. Happiness isn't something that depends on our surroundings. It's something we make inside ourselves. Anybody know who the author of those 
sayings and many, many more is, Sue, I see you nodding your head because you visited her home, right? And her name is? Cory Ten Boom. Yeah, author of Hiding Place, a memoir of her experience during World War II as her family of Christians hid Jews who were, being, were in danger of being killed. And then finally, her and her family were also sent to a concentration camp and how she experienced her Savior in a greater depth there. I think maybe those statements I read are true and we nod to them, but when you look at the life in which they were forged, they have a different significance. And I hope we make the same discovery this morning as we look at the promise that Jesus gave about prayer, and we see it in the context in which it was given. And I'm going to approach this, frankly, on a very basic level, because that's kind of where I need to be right now, is really pretty basic. I, I want to think through this with you, because last week as we went through the first official public sermon that we have of Jesus, we came to that last beatitude, and it's the one, frankly, I want to skip over. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when, when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because he speaks like that's going to happen. And more and more, I think we find ourselves that that is the case, that it's increasingly unpopular to believe in absolute truth it's increasingly unpopular to believe that you are right. If that means that somebody else therefore is wrong, you must be narrow and ignorant. <laughs> Blessed are you when people falsely accuse you and say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad. There's our word again. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, we're going to lump several things under the same category of suffering, persecution being one of those. Aging and illness and, and impairment, and that's one of those as well, as we are in bodies that weren't designed to decay, but now are decaying because of the effects of sin and the curse. I spoke to a guy who is suffering. You know his name, Russell. He greets you, by the way, from Louisiana, though he's a Buckeye. He's in Louisiana because of a life sentence he's serving. But he's in a process of clemency where the governor, having to make the budget meet, they have to get rid of people they think are low risk, and it looks like that's going to happen to him. His hearing has not taken place yet. But for financial reasons, they've got to get rid of these people, and they're going to send him back to Ohio. <laughs> But his suffering came because of choices he made. And the reality is, we all experience that. There are consequences of choices we make with a wonder, why in the world, Lord, am I going through this? I realize I deserve it. Well, when does it end? And it just feels over the top. And so the gospel is the story of God became sin for us, that in him we might be made the righteousness of God. Our suffering falls in all kinds of ranges, whether it's because we name Christ or because we're in a broken planet or because of choices we've made and consequences that ensue. But surely He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Blessed are those. Blessed are those. How can this be part of the blessed life, this painful thing that we endure? And so... I remind you of some words that we saw from Tim Keller a few weeks ago. If we're looking for pain-free living and we think that that's what comes with the gospel and the good news, that now uh, nothing bad will ever happen to me, well, Keller writes, reflecting the teaching of Scripture, that there is no way to get through life unless you know how to get through suffering, and there's no way to get through suffering unless you have a living hope. And as Jesus instructed his troops for the last critical moment before his betrayal and crucifixion, this thing we call the upper room discourse that carried on out through a vineyard and ultimately ends up near the Mount of Olives. He gave them critical teaching that frankly overwhelmed them, but he says that later you're going to remember the things that I told you. And so before I read this, and I'm just going to read a snatch of chapter 16, I just want to say 
that sometimes we got to look at the very basic level of things because we get lost in the emotional fog and we get lost in the intellectual fog and we hurt. So I just want you to think about three basic things with me. In fact, I would encourage you to read the whole thing, chapter 14, chapter 13, right through chapter 17 and see the whole big picture. But just ask, what did Jesus say? What did Jesus do? What did Jesus promise? Jesus went on to say, in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me. At this, some of his disciples said to one another, what does he mean by saying, in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me? And because I'm going to the Father, they kept asking, what does he mean by a little while? Can I say that pain comes in a variety of flavors, and anxiety is one of them? And so he's telling them something important, but they're not getting it. We don't understand what he's saying. Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about this, so he said to them, are you asking one another what I meant when I said, in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will still see me? Truly, I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come, but when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you. Now is your time of grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice and no one will take away your joy. In that day you will no longer ask me anything. Very truly I tell you, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. May I ask you, what does the context give us in terms of understanding of the promise that we memorize? He is giving them a promise that they will absolutely need to get through what is ahead for them. Ask, I'll hear you. And so when the emotional pressure was going to build, when the intellectual thing about why is this happening, and how could he, they are given this avenue of not simply trying to get things from God, that's really secondary. But experiencing fellowship with the living, holy, just God who has made a way that we can enjoy His presence. That we can come and ask Him our bold questions and lay our confusion before Him and cast our heavy burden on the Lord knowing He will sustain us. And so here is this wonderful prayer promise in the midst of a whole teaching about difficulty. Well, our Savior often surprises us. He said things He knew would hurt people. He did things He knew would hurt People, people he loved. And he promised things he knew would help people. While we could spend months and months, if not years, let's look at some of the highlights. Jesus said things he knew would hurt people. I'm leaving. I was raised in northern Indiana. My mother was from southwest Missouri. We didn't know that word in northern Indiana. (laughs) My dad was from Pennsylvania. And so for years it was a week go east and a week go west and getting reacquainted with the people that we were blood with and it was wonderful. And I know there were a terrible moment at the end of each of those times together where we would track off and coming back from a place that we had gone to stay for a week, going fishing, fishing but not catching by the way, Uh, And we'd hit a fork in the road, and we would go off to the east, and they would go to the south. And the tears would flow when we hit that intersection. And we knew it was coming. We'd had such a great time together. I am leaving is never a kind thing that you hear from someone who loves you, but it's an inevitability. And Jesus said the hard words to them, I am leaving. Jesus said things he knew would hurt people. 
You will grieve. I know full well how this is going to impact you. And they had had the time of their lives. How many times do you hear that in the lyrics of a song? The time of our lives. And there was a a nostalgia that would grow around that, that they would hope those times would never end. Oh, don't you wish we could go back to pre-COVID days? Oh, when things get back to... We too are gripped by this thing. Can I tell you in terms of the plans of God, let's not go back. You will grieve. Then he says you will be scattered. I I read this early in COVID days and the phrase that jumped out at me from his teaching here was that you would each go to your own homes. (laughs) You'll be scattered and you should go to your own homes. Kind of an early installment of COVID, apparently. Social distancing. And then he tells him probably the most hurtful thing. You will leave me all alone. By the way, he goes on to say, but the Father will not leave me alone. I think of all the emotional angst that was unplaying in the heart of our Savior as he walked through that. I understand a little bit more of why he wept great drops of, like it were great drops of blood. That the angels had to come and attend to him because in his humanness there was also that weakness. But I know very little of the enormity of the burden he was carrying that day. We just get glimpses. I am leaving. You will grieve. You will be scattered. You will leave me all alone. These are so important that he included these things because so often we edit the Word of God and we edit the works of Jesus and we edit these things so that it fits. (sighs) Okay, he says, pray this way. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. But really, I'm hoping it'll come so that my kingdom will come. I hope his will be done will be good for my will. Tim Keller tells us that if you have not had your heart broken by this Jesus, you've not met the real Jesus. And we'll edit his words because he's going to speak those necessary, true words that address the issues of our heart. He said things he knew would hurt people. Jesus did things he knew would hurt people. Uh, Okay, these are words spoken, but it is a rebuke. And I think one of the striking things, while this rebuke comes much earlier, the one I've quoted here, Get Behind Me, Satan, in Matthew 16, when we're in the upper room, there's two more visitations of something like this with Peter. Uh, Peter says, you'll never wash my feet, John 13, part of this upper room discourse. And Jesus says, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me. And so speaking strong words to him about the reality of spiritual cleansing that's going to come only at the hand of the Savior... And so, if I don't wash you, you have no part in me. Then later he said, I'm not going to deny you. And uh, again, Jesus spoke strong words to him. Deny me? You'll deny me three times. And so rebuke is part of the things he does that he knows will hurt people. But because we live in distortions, Remember weeks ago, one of the things that steals your joy is ignorance and distortion. Get behind me, Satan, was rebuke. And of course, then he died, and then he left, and all those are things that would hurt people because they kind of wanted things to be normal. I'm reminded that love is not giving people what they want. Love is giving people what they need. And when our thinking is distorted, it is a loving thing for him to confront that. And what is more confrontational than the truth that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and that my own heart is deceitful and desperately wicked and who can know it? God searches the hearts. And so in his love, he speaks words that hurt that he might heal. He does things that hurt that he might bring us farther into his heart. I'm so glad that as we cover this upper room, or this upper room discourse, it is loaded with promises. He says, it's, I'm leaving, but it's for your own good that I go, because if I go, I'm going to send the comforter. I won't leave you like orphans. I'm going to send the comforter. I will send the Spirit. 
It's been a few weeks, but we find that the relationship between joy and the Holy Spirit is, is a, a link that can't be broken. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. <laughs> And we step into that life of being indwelt by God Himself, the Spirit. And He addresses our thinking in our hearts. He intercedes for us. He brings things to our memory. He convicts us of sin. How necessary such a comforter is. I will send the Spirit. And He sent Him. I have much more to say, but He, the Spirit, will guide you into truth. This is, seems to be pointing to the completion of the work of Revelation. There's a little word, the, in front of truth. He will guide you into all the truth. And so the New Testament epistles would be written, and that whole body of revealed truth would be fleshed out. And so one of the promises here is I'm going to complete the revelation of the written Word of God. And then he gives that precious promise that we quoted earlier. Until now, you've not asked for anything in my name. Ask, and you will receive, and your joy will be complete. And so we have to learn this whole activity of going to God in prayer and enjoying his fellowship and laying our needs before him and ask, and you will receive. And then, of course, this fourth promise among many, your grief will be turned to joy. Your grief will be turned to joy. Our surprising Savior, He says things to us as we read His Word that hurt us. When we need the hurt. He did things He knew would hurt people, but He keeps promises He knows will save people. It's been uh, quite a time for us, hasn't it? Uh, Mark and I were comparing notes this week as we talked about joy and suffering and did a little review of last week with regard to blessing, being people who are blessed and keeping that in mind despite what happens around us. And he said, boy, I'd really need to hear that because I've had a really rough day today. Thanks for sharing that much, Mark. <laughs> and how that helped just thinking again of the blessing that God, blessed are. And what I didn't tell you is I'd had kind of a rough week too. And it's challenging to talk to a prisoner who's not free. We've had that challenge every year when we visit and we leave and he stays. It's challenging to visit, speak Marge on the phone. And I said, Marge, you know, every time I go to the hardware store, I think about you because I have to cross Palmer Road. And <laughs> we reminisce for just a minute that says, you know, Dick did all that basically with one arm. Suffered from polio. And man, it was such a great place. And so many wonderful memories there. She says, yeah, but it's kind of, I understand it's kind of fallen into disrepair. And that was, that was a sadness. But it was the reality that we can't hold on to all these things. That life kind of pairs us away the longer we get. And then to speak with John, boy, does he have his fall planned out. Another surgery Wednesday this week, and hopefully that'll make way for another surgery to repair his arm, and they're hoping that with some radiation there'll be another surgery to remove the lesion on his neck, and that doesn't even begin to deal with the underlying need to treat a cancer that has invaded his body and is taking over. Jesus keeps promises he knows will save people. The pain that the disciples go through in the upper room and in the days thereafter are unique, and yet they are typical. And if we think that God is entitled us to something else, we haven't read the things that he would reveal and has already revealed. Count it all joy when you encounter all kinds of trials. 2 Corinthians, Paul writes, Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all, so we fix our eyes not on what is seen. That's the place of the, the pain and the hurt and the uncertainty. We fix our eyes on what is unseen. 
Since what is seen is temporary and what is unseen is eternal, and John and I have had to visit this more than once that he is in a chapter, but this is not the end of the book. Paul also wrote, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, we also glory in our sufferings. What? We glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces. What? It's not something you simply endure. It is an important tool to perform work in your own heart that the good being conformed to the image of Christ. God causes all things to work for the good. That suffering produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. These are not alien ideas that we are living through today. And frankly, many of our brothers and sisters have things much, much worse. Well, I've spent some time reading and reading and rereading an essay this week that I would commend to you if you've not read it and reread it and reread it again by C.S. Lewis. It's based on one of the passages I just quoted from Paul, The Weight of Glory. And it's, uh, I think, about as profound as you can get. I just want to give you a couple or three snatches from it. He talks about this yearning that we have writ deep within us that sometimes we feel some resonance with, but it's always passing that you may read a book and he specifically thinks of a book of poetry that he loves and how the author thinks about childhood memories or earlier days, a love lost or a, a wonderful experience in nature, but that's gone. But for a moment we resonate with that or maybe it's beautiful music that we hear and get caught up in the rapture of that and the grandness, not unlike what you did with the newsboys. Did you ever think the newsboys would make your heart resonate like they did today? <laughs> Here's what Lewis writes. The books or the music in which we thought the beauty was located will betray if we trust to them. It was not in them. It only came through them for what came through was longing. He builds on that for about eight pages and I've got three paragraphs. I hope I whet your appetite to read and reread his essay. These things are good images of what we really desire, but if they are mistaken for the thing itself, they turn into dumb idols breaking the hearts of the worshipers. Got that? If you're hungry for the good old days, let's be honest, they weren't that good. And if we make them the idol for what we want to go back to, our hearts will be broken. So Lewis continues with these words. The promise of glory becomes highly relevant to our deep desire because glory meant good report from God, acceptance by God, response, acknowledgement, and welcome into the heart of things. The door we have been knocking on all our lives will open at last. Let's see if I can simplify. <laughs> Corey Ten Boom will do a good job for us. You can never learn that Christ is all you need until Christ is all you have. C.S. Lewis, Corey Ten Boom, I think we better remember the words of Jesus. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. Until now, you've not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive, and your joy will be complete. Could it be 
that God has gotten our attention by shaking our routines and even our sense of what will ever be normal again, that we might grasp his promise of prayer as never before. That we might enter into his fellowship through that avenue as never before. That we having parts of our life carved away that we be focused more on why we're here than ever before. Now, I mentioned these things to you, but I would be negligent not to bring you back to the heart of all that, and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That God saw the longing and the brokenness in us because of our own sins, and because of the, the sins of Adam visited upon us as his heirs. We were estranged from God and broken, but God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive while we were still dead. And he did it in Christ. Christ who came to this earth to be sin for us, going to that cross, warning those disciples, telling them ahead of time, I'm going to leave. And where I'm going, you can't come, but you will see me again, and you will come because now you know the way. God offers you a way to come into His family and into His presence and into His forever, but you can't take your sins with you. And he made a provision that those might be dealt with in the cross and the death of Christ. That while you are a beggar and while you are empty and while you are broken, he offers you wholeness and healing and forgiveness. And so as Gay and Gary shared earlier, there's a time, a moment when you sense that calling on your life that God is speaking to you about your business and your sin. And it's in His kindness He speaks those hurtful things to you. We encourage you, today if you hear His voice, do not harden your heart. Pray with me. And so Lord Jesus, I thank You for Your Word. I thank You for this incredibly intense episode that we've taken snatches from as you instructed your disciples on what to expect in life. I thank you for the hard sayings. I thank you for the hard actions. I thank you for the wonderful promises. Lord God, I pray for any here today that have yet to trust you as Lord and Savior, that you by your grace and goodness might open their eyes. And grant them the faith to believe. And they will turn to you and find joy. These things we ask in the name of our Savior.